at Dala Hill. Their ancestor was then known as Kanu. They lived in communities headed by their chief priest. The most celebrated of the priests was Balbuje, the grandson of Kanu and the priest of Sumburbura. Heroic legendary Barbushe is described as a very dark complexioned man of great stature and might. As a hunter, he was said to slay giant elephants with a stick and carry them on his back upwards of 14 and a half kilometers. In spite of the historic military might and mystic prowess of Barbushe, he was eventually overpowered by Bagoda, the grandson of Bayajidda, the mythical hero and founder of Hausa land. The emergence of the Bagoda dynasty with King Bagoda, who reigned over Kano from 999 AD to 1063 AD, has been credited with paving the way for the development of Kano from a simple settlement of communities into a city-state with a well-defined system of governance and centralized authority. To retain her territorial integrity and protect her status as a sovereign entity, King Gijimasu, the third king of Kanu and the grandson of Bagoda, began the building of the city wall around Kanu. Starting from the foot of Dala Hill in 1112 AD, the wall was built as a defensive measure against potential external aggressors. It marks her territorial boundaries beyond their defensive utilities. Kanu is established within the Savannah region of Sub-Saharan Africa. And Savannah region being what it is, is plain which means the land is flat. A community that finds itself in such a place needs protection. Needs protection from invaders, from enemies. And this issue of insecurity because of the nature of the topography, the nature of the land being flat, the, no sooner did people started to increase then the need of security came up. Hence, the beginning of the establishment or of the building of the city walls. The wall was built with community effort. The then king invited people from all over to come and build the wall. But the wall was built first in such a way as to protect the city from within and from without because on both sides of the city wall originally there was a moat long ditch full of water nobody could cross that water and climb the wall it was a protective measure and it served the purpose so Kano became what it is today, a center of commerce and industry, a rendezvous of business and businessmen, because of the Kano wall, because of the protection it got as a result of the wall built around it. With a circumference covering about 24 kilometers in its original state and an enclosed area of more than 15 square kilometers, the Kanu city wall measured about 30 to 40 feet in height and a thickness of about 100 feet at the broadest portion of the base. This irregular oval-shaped city wall encouraged compact neighborhoods and a sense of communal togetherness serving not only as a physical barrier from the outside world alone, but also as a symbolic power of fraternity, resistance, strength, and determination of the people to continue to coexist in peace, in spite of their differences in background or origins. The 
walls had protected the lives and property of not only those men out there, but even their families. And these include the children, the elderly, and the women. Not only that, that protective measures had by extension enhanced the economic activities because if there were no peace, there wouldn't be any economic activities. And that has also enriched the wealth of their husbands as well as those women that were engaged in one economic activity or the other because there were lots of economic activities that women were indulged in. Developing from a simple settlement into a city-state and, subsequently, a kingdom, Kano was able to establish commercial relations with many other localities in West Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East. Above all, it derived prestige and wealth from its strategic position during the Trans-Sahara trade. It was able to establish and build the biggest market in West Africa at that time. And that market was a market which, which is called Kulmi Market. This Kulmi Market made Kano the essential metropolis of regional trade in West Africa. And the trade between the forest zone of West Africa and the Savannah Belt had its headquarters in Kano. And the trade coming from North Africa through the Sahara, which is usually called Trans-Saharan trade, also had its headquarters here in Kano. So Kano became an important market place and an economic metropolis. To gain access into Kano City then was only possible and obtainable through several narrow gates fitted with heavy iron-plated doors. Each gateway was roofed and ingeniously devised in order that the defenders of the city might use every possible means to repel an attack. The first of the gates to be established was Ofer Kansakali, built in 1112 AD by King Gijimasu. Kansakali is a Hausa word which literally connotes a sword. The area where the gate was established had presumably been the site of many battles. The gate played a significant role as an entry point during the Trans-Saharan trade. The second gate constructed in the 12th century was Koferweka. It was located behind the historic Gorondutse hill. Koferweka is just a few kilometers from Kofer Kansakali. The gate was meant to provide an additional and alternative entry and exit point into the city. As trade continued to flourish in Kano and the expansion of the city wall progressed, Koferkwe was established. The gate was later renamed Kofer Dawano in 1470 AD as a result of the popularity of Dawano one of the richest and influential farmers at that time. He built a farmhouse very close to the gate in 1567 AD. The booming famous Doano agricultural produce market today is attributed to that. Koferroa was also one of the 12th century gates built by King Gijimasu. The gate, which was initially known as Kofer Lunkui, was renamed as a result of a heavy rainfall that destroyed some parts of the gate. Hence, the new name from the Hausa word, Rua, which means water, evolved. Driven by the desire to leave a lasting legacy, King Gijimasu, on completion of another gate, named it Kofer Mazugal. The erection of these gates represents the singular indicator of the journey of Kano City through centuries of prosperity and challenges and also creating a clear picture of her enduring strength in the face of several attempted invasions. The expansion of, of the city gates itself also represents the development and the record of achievements of uh, successive rulers of, in, of Kano. 
And uh, secondly, it also tells you much about the technology and the skills that was developed. And it has proved to be a very remarkable defensive mechanism. The second phase of construction of the city gates may have occurred in the 15th century and credited to Muhammadur Rumfa, the emir who conceived the idea of building Gidan Rumfa, the present emir of Kano's palace. Deliberately locating the palace at the center of the city for defensive purposes, a new wall was also built to enclose it along the present line. Hence, Kofar Mata, Kofar Nasawa, Kofar Tang Agundi, and Kofar Naisai gates were established respectively. The gates all have their unique features and stories. The story of Kofar Naisa, for instance, is still quite alive in the minds of the people of Kano City today. Before now, the gate was called Kofar Dugu. The gate was usually locked at night. A Fulani horseman once arrived late and was prevented from entering the city. He angrily broke part of the wall and forced his way in. The ruling emir called for adjudication and the Fulani man said he broke the wall because he possessed the power to do it. That's how the gate acquired the name Kofar Naisa. Hence Kofar Dugu was abandoned and Naisa put to use. The third great time of expansion and continuous building of the Kano city wall and gates was ascribed to the reign of the 28th Emir of Kano, Muhammadu Zaki Nazaki. This era of expansion is credited largely to the unflinching loyalty of Wambei Giwa, one of the principal chiefs of the Emir. He spearheaded the construction of Kofar Gadonkaya, Kofar Dukawia, and Kofar Kabuga. Built in 1619, Kofar Gadonkaya was said to be the narrowest of all the gates on the Kano city wall, with a width only wide enough for a laden donkey to pass through. Though the roof of the gatehouse has now disappeared, the vertical walls with its associated attributes have remained intact over the years. Alhaji Isa Idris still proudly holds and religiously protects the remains of the ancient key handed down to him through generations of his forefathers. He has occupied this hereditary position of Serkin Kofar Gadonkaya for over 40 years now. This title literally means the custodian of Gadonkaya Gate. <laughs> During the era of my great-grandfathers, that room served as a guard room for offenders and lawbreakers. They are locked in the room until morning when they are taken before their ward head for further disciplinary actions. Kofar Dukawia is also one of the most interesting gateways along the historic 19.2 kilometer long radius fortress. It encloses not only the inhabited areas, but also a considerable extent of agricultural land. It has a unique myth. There is one farmer that always carries heavy loads on his neck. Uh, that is one version. So he has to be called El Kawia. The later on, as time goes on, it has been changed to do Kawia. Another version of the story is that our forefathers, the Serkin Kofa, has a friend. So normally anybody that used to get in or out of the gates has to be some royalties. So simply because he is the friend of the Serki, he insisted that he is not going to pay the royalties. So the Zariki decided to beat him in the neck. So he then asked the Zariki, oh, so your gate has been the gate of beating people in their neck? 
kopaka ka zama kofar duka a huya so that was how it comes to be called duka huya so there are two versions of the story as expansion work on the Kano wall continued northwards from Dukawia, the Emir ordered the construction of another gate, which was eventually named Kofar Kabuga. The gate is said to be named in honor of a prominent Islamic scholar who lost his wife and followed the corpse to the gravesite out of shock and against the norms of the people. He then met them at the gravesite and asked that he should be buried along with his wife. That was how the name Kabuka came about. It was initially used to make mockery of the Islamic preacher, Nana Muhammad. At the time of the British conquest of Kano in 1903, the city wall was said to be in a perfect state of repair because the people of Kano ensured they continuously guarded and maintained the wall, which remained their symbol of security. This, no doubt, made the capturing of Kano a rather Herculean task for the British. The successful British invasion of Kano marked the beginning of massive and continuous encroachment of this monumental protective earthwork. The cannon-launched attack on Kofar Kabuga was believed to be the point at which the British forcefully broke through to eventually capture Kano. When the British conquered this place, they now isolated the city and they started establishing other residential areas outside it. They established the southern valley, which was to quota only people from the south and the essentially Christians, Igbos, Yorubas, and so on, but only Christians. Then they created another area, which is Chibuwada, which is to quota people from the north, who are essentially Muslims, but who they now designated as people who did not have their origins in Kano. Then they now established their own world, which is Nasarawa, which was to quota Europeans. Despite the British conquest, the expansion of the city wall still continued under successive rulers of Kano. A notable addition to the already existing gates was Kofar Middle, built by the then Sirkin Kano, Al-Haji Abdullahi Bayeru, in 1927. The establishment of the gate was necessitated by the desire to ease the movement of students from the city to the middle school, one of the oldest and most prominent schools in northern Nigeria. Today, the gate is known as Sabwar Kofa, and the then middle school is now Rumfa College, if you take the distance from, say, Kofar Nasarawa to the, uh, to the school, or from Abundi to the school, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big distance. I was living in Yakasi, which is uh, very far away from the school, and uh, therefore it was easier for me to go there straight away from the, the gate, or from school into the gate, and then through the school for every series up to say uh, Kankarobi and then into Yakase. In 1928, Abdullahi Bahiru established another gate named Kofar Fomfu. This was because the gate was built to allow easy passage to the main pipe supplying water to Kano City. Emir Abdullahi Bahiru made tremendous contributions towards the preservation of the old city gates and wall, even in the face of British colonial subjugation. The various gates and parts of the wall have, over the years, witnessed several bouts of natural and man-made damage. In some places, houses were built directly on the wall. This is Tubali. Tubali is the house name for the triangular-shaped mud block obtainable when this wall was originally built. It is obviously one of the remains of this 12th century protective and defensive monument. It then defined Kano territorial integrity, but unfortunately, the wall is but a shadow of itself. While these gates and the wall may not necessarily perform their initial security functions, 
Their tourism potential cannot be overemphasized. And tourism is one area which the government can really look into so that uh, you, the job opportunities and of course the huge sum of revenue, the foreign exchange added, the national income, taxes, the multiplier concept, all these are things that comes together with tourism. Tourism wise, the original is the most important. If you can preserve and protect the original, I think it will be better and it will be more valuable. That original is what a tourist always wants to see. It is a pity that at one time the city wall was tampered with. Kind of city wall should have been preserved and protected. Kind of city wall should not have been tampered with. To safeguard these historical monuments in 19... Gidang Agundi were removed from their original sites to the Gidang Makama Museum. Today, the museum houses many relics of the Kanawa civilization. The call to safeguard and preserve these monumental structures has continued to echo across Kano. The Kano state government and all other stakeholders should work hard on reclamation reactivation and protection of the uh, walls and gates. One of the uh, examples of uh, the interest developed by stakeholders is the uh, city walls, uh, the about a uh, 300 meter city wall structure that we have built at Saborkova with the assistance of you know, German Fund for Cultural Preservation. So if we could get this kind of assistance over time, you will find out that uh, a good proportion of the city wall can be recreated and uh, the general context of its value can be better appreciated. Now then, if a country, a Western European country, can have a, an interest in the development of the city wall, why not our own governments? And that is why we are appealing to the government that have a sense of history to make sure that the remaining city wall is preserved and protected even for historical reasons. The modern Kofar Naisa and the magnificently built Sabuel Kofa are parts of the swift response to the clarion call. Equally, the rebuilt Kofar Nasarawa, which provides a dual central carriageway for the first ever flyover bridge in Kano, is an attestation to the fact that though history has been stripped off of its originality, Kano State is determined to open yet another page in its existence in an effort to retain history within the ambit of modern developmental demands. I see Kano rediscovering its past with agriculture, with industrialization. However, we will need to continue working with government. The ascension of the Emir of Kano, His Royal Highness Mohammed Senussi II, to the throne of his forefathers as the 14th Fulani Emir of Kano, further holds the promise of more developmental strides around the great Kano city wall and gates, for it to maintain its touristic relevance. Given the Emir's sartorial, cerebral, and cosmopolitan interest towards leading his people to greatness, the Kanu City Wall and Gates, as it is today, is only but the dawn of a new era.
taxation, that depressing but constant reality on the minds of everyone.